Hello everyone, my name is Claire and I'm going to be doing the Lives of Stars portion of Typas um, and this is the, the lecture for you. Um, I so just wanted to say we're all um, you know, very sorry that we can't be there in Thailand with you. Um, it, is it is disappointing but due to Covid we can't all be there. Um, you know, hopefully you still you know, get out of this what you would like to get out of this. You improve your Python skills, you learn some astronomy. Um, so I was at, in Thailand for Thai Pass 2019 and it was um, and it was an amazing experience. Um, I love Thailand, I love the country, it's beautiful, everyone's very friendly, very nice um, and Thai food is my favourite so I love that as well. Um, but mostly I love the experience of Thai Pass and um, being there with the students and teaching, doing these lectures, helping people improve their Python skills. Um, and seeing people really enjoy that and really put a lot of effort into it. So unfortunately, we're not all there together, but I hope you still enjoy this type online type pass. Um, you know, you still learn some astronomy and learn some Python. Um, yeah, and hopefully in the future, this may be back in Thailand again at some point. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about supernova mainly. Um, so if we were there in person in Thailand, um, we would have had a full day on the lives of stars. So you would have had more than one lecture. Um, so this lecture is concentrating on supernova um, mainly, and it gives you some good Python exercises to do to improve your Python skills at the end of it. So unfortunately you don't get the whole lives of stars, but Hopefully the supernova bit is, is uh, interesting for you and you get lots of pretty um, images obviously from the supernova remnants as well. So I'm just going to briefly go over the life cycle of a star. Um, hopefully you know some about this already so it's not too unfamiliar to you. So stars are formed in clouds of gas and dust which are known as nebulae. So this gas um, cools and becomes dense and eventually you form a star. Now nuclear reactions at the center, at the core of stars and provide enough energy to make them shine brightly for many, many years. And this stage is known as the main sequence of a star. So this is here on this image, the main sequence. Um, and stars spend most of their lives in this phase, converting hydrogen into helium in their cores nothing much changes in this stage of the star's lives and the star slowly gets bigger and brighter but it sits there doing the same thing for many many years now the exact lifetime of a star depends on its size so very large massive stars burn through their energy burn through their fuel in their core very quickly um, so they may only last a few hundred thousand years Whereas smaller stars like our sun may sit on the main sequence for several billion years because they burn their fuel much more slowly. So the sun has only burned half of its fuel in 4.5 billion years. Whereas a massive star, it might take only 10 to 100 million years. So the main sequence is similar for both um, small and more massive stars. Eventually, the hydrogen fuel that powers the nuclear reactions in the core will begin to run out and then they'll enter the final phases of their lifetime. So over time, as this fuel runs out in the core, they will expand and cool and change colour to become red giants. So we have a red giant in the um, lower mass star and a red supergiant for a higher mass star. And the path they then follow depends on the mass of the star. So small stars like the sun will undergo a relatively peaceful and quite beautiful death that sees them pass through a planetary nebula phase here where their outer layers just float off into space and become a planetary nebula and it leaves a white dwarf at the centre. Um, and this white dwarf will eventually over, time, over a very long time cool down and stop emitting radiation and become a black dwarf. Massive stars, though, um, have quite an energetic and violent end. 
Um, and this sees the, the stellar material scattered about across the galaxy in an enormous explosion called a supernova. And once all this clears, you'll see at the centre will be left as a very dense star known as a neutron star. These can often be rapidly spinning and are known as pulsars. If the star which explodes is even more massive, we can be left with a black hole. So the main, the important thing to take from this is that the remnant that's left depends on the initial stellar mass. So if we have a star up to eight solar masses, like our sun, we get a planetary nebula and a white dwarf left over at the end. If we have a star that's eight to 25 solar masses, we get a supernova and a neutron star left over at the end. If we have a star that's 25 solar masses or possibly above, we get a supernova and a black hole left over at the end. So the supernova only really come in with the most massive stars. So our sun won't um, explode in a supernova, but more massive stars will. the topic of this talk is supernova so you'll be hearing a lot about them so what is a supernova well super means large or powerful and nova is a star which shows a sudden large increase in brightness and then slowly returns to its original state over a few months so nova is a star that becomes suddenly bright for a while and then dims back down so when supernova were first observed, it was thought they were new stars because there was suddenly a bright light in a part of the sky that had been studied before, um, but we hadn't seen it before. So they were thought it was, it was a new star. But actually they're the result um, of the later stages of the life of a massive star. The supernova played uh, an important role in the history of science because it proved that the idea that stars were eternal and unchanging was wrong. So this had dominated Western scientific thought um, since the time of the ancient Greeks. So it was thought as we look at the sky, you know, nothing really changes. The sky looks, you know, more the same um, every time we look at it. And um, so it was thought that it didn't change. It just stayed the same. But the um, discovery of supernova proved that it, it didn't. So supernova were there for long enough to make parallax observations possible. So parallax observations are where we use the movement of um, an object on the sky um, to determine its distance. So objects that are close to us, like the planets, we see them move across the sky and we can take parallax measurements. But objects that are very far away, um, like far away stars or other galaxies, they don't move across the sky very much because they are very far away. So the discovery of supernova, um, they learned that they must be further away than you know, the moon, the planets, and so it's this is a very far away object. So a supernova is the explosion of a, of a huge star, a massive star, and it happens when nuclear fusion in the core can no longer um, hold up the star against gravity. Um, so I'll talk more about that in a bit. So they emit energy equal to that um, released over the whole lifetime of the star. So when a star sits on the main sequence, it's emitting energy. When you get a supernova, you have all of the energy at once, um, straight away like that. And it's the same as the energy that it actually emits for its, its whole life. Um, and it's so bright, so it brightens by about 10 orders of magnitude in a few hours. So this can outshine the entire galaxy that it's in. Um, so that's how bright it is. So they're very violent events which transfer a huge amount of energy into the interstellar medium. Now the interstellar medium is the gas that's between stars. So in a galaxy you have your stars and all of the bits in between the stars is called the interstellar medium and it's full of low density gas. Um, so supernova can have um, an important effect on the galaxy. This is an example of a supernova in another galaxy. Um, so here we have 
uh, the galaxy before the supernova. And here we have the galaxy with the supernova. So for a few weeks, a supernova can outshine an entire galaxy and it's hundreds of billions of stars. So you can see how bright it is compared to the galaxy in this image. But as the, the shell of gas um, that it's thrown off in its explosion, as it radiates away its energy, it cools and the supernova gradually fades um, and dims to about 1% of its peak luminosity after a few months. So it doesn't stay that bright forever, but when it's just happened, it's very, very bright and it can outshine the entire galaxy. <clears throat> So there are two ways that supernova happen and observationally there are two different types of supernova. And this depends on um, the elements that we see in the emitted radiation. So type two supernova, also known as core collapse supernova, they occur when the core of a massive star collapses at the end of its nuclear burning phase. So in stars of up to 10 solar masses, nuclear fusion proceeds up to iron. So the star has an onion-like structure, like in this image. You can see different layers of different elements here, and they're fused all the way to iron. Now, when iron is formed in the core, no more fusion can happen, because fusion into he heavier elements than iron doesn't give a release of energy, but it actually requires energy to be taken in. Um, and so the star then collapses. So stars are in a constant state of balance throughout their lives. So we have the, the pressure from the nuclear fusion in the core that pushes outwards. And then you have gravity, which pulls inwards. And to be stable, you need the pressure from the fusion to balance the gravity that's pulling it in. And so as long as these the pressure balances the gravity, the star is stable. But when fusion stops, there's no longer any pressure that's pushing out. So the, the gravity takes over and the star collapses under gravity. So all of these layers that are on top of the iron collapse and fall towards the iron core. Then they suddenly rebound and are ejected. So in a fraction of a second, this iron rich core collapses and it goes from a sphere with that's roughly the size of the Earth with a radius of 6000 kilometers and it collapses to a ball with a radius of about 50 kilometers and that's in a fraction of a second. <clears throat> so this is a huge energetic event, a very energetic event. And another type of supernova is a type 1A supernova. So these form in a different way. These types of supernova happen when a white dwarf and a larger star are in a binary, so they're in a pair. Remember, a white dwarf comes from a low mass star. It's a remnant of a low mass star. If it has um, another star, which is in a pair, so they're orbiting each other, the white dwarf can actually accrete matter from this star, like this. This then causes the white dwarf to become more massive. Now, we just talked about balancing pressure with gravity. White dwarfs support themselves against gravity by something called electron degeneracy pressure. So this is due to the electrons and protons repelling each other. So electrons have a negative charge, protons have a positive charge, and they don't like, um, you know, they, well, the electrons around the outside of an atom don't want to be pushed against the electrons around the outside of this other atom. So they repel each other because we don't want negative, negative charges together. This pressure is what stops the white dwarf from collapsing under gravity. But when the white dwarf gets heavier, um, around 1.4 solar masses, it can't support itself under this pressure anymore, and it collapses. This is called the Chandrasekhar limit. It's the, ma the mass, the maximum mass that a white dwarf can have before it collapses. 
because electron degeneracy pressure cannot provide the pressure anymore. So gravity wins and it collapses. Um, now these supernova are very bright as the other supernova are, but they have mostly the same brightness because of this mass limit. Every white dwarf has the same mass limit. So when they collapse and we have a supernova explosion, they're about the same brightness. This allows them to be used as standard candles um, and they can measure the distance to their host galaxies this way because we know if it's a type 1a supernova we know how bright we expect it to be. And the main difference between these and the core collapse supernovae is the presence of hydrogen in their absorption lines when we observe them. So core collapse supernova do have hydrogen in their absorption lines. You saw the onion-like layers of the star, hydrogen is present there. <clears throat> with a white dwarf, you're left with a, um, a carbon oxygen core and there's no hydrogen layers around. So when the supernova explodes, there's no hydrogen there. So we don't see it in the um, observations. So we can tell by observing them whether it was a supernova from a white dwarf that secreted mass or a core collapse supernovae. So supernovae, they're an instantaneous release of 10 to the 51 ergs or 10 to the 31 megatons of energy. Again, this is the amount of energy a solar type star like this sort of mix in its whole lifetime with a supernova emitted all at once. So this big explosion blows the stellar material away from the star at about 30,000 kilometers per second, which is 0.1 times the speed of light. This drives a shock wave into the surrounding gas. So we have the core, we have the layers of material that have been built up by nuclear fusion. And then we have the gas outside of the star, which we call the interstellar medium. So a shock wave is driven into this material um, and it goes outwards and into the interstellar medium and it sweeps up this gas as it moves out and this is what we see as a supernova remnant. Um, so some heavy elements can be also be created in this way which I'll talk about um, in, a, in a bit um, and this can push these elements out and spread them around the galaxy. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the history of supernova observations. So SN185 is possibly the earliest recorded supernova. I mean, it was observed by Chinese astronomers in 185 AD. The brightest recorded supernova was SN1006, which occurred in 1006 AD. And it was described by observers across China, Japan, Iraq, Egypt and Europe, so it's seen across the world. Um, there were two that have been observed in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, SN1572, also known as Ty uh, which was observed by Tycho Bray, and SN1604, observed by Johannes Kepler. These were the latest to be observed with the naked eye in our own galaxy. So we didn't need a telescope to see these supernova. The one in 1604 was bright enough to be observed from the Northern Hemisphere, in particular without a telescope. Um, no supernova have been observed in our galaxy since, but we have seen others outside of our galaxy. Um, now, supernova, well, why haven't we seen any in our own galaxy since then? Well, supernova are quite rare. Most stars are low mass stars, and so they don't explode in supernova. More massive stars are more rare in our galaxy. So we can see supernova in other galaxies. Um, so every year we see around 300 supernova in other galaxies. Well, there are lots and lots of galaxies, so there's lots of chances to see the supernova. It is easier to see the remnant of the supernova because this lasts longer than the brightest explosion phase, the phase where we saw a bright star outshining the whole galaxy. The remnant phase lasts longer than that, so it's easier to see those. Um, 
as I said, the, the observations of these supernovae were very important for the history of science because it showed that things did change in space, things happened, it didn't just stay the same um, all the time. Now I'm just going to show you a few supernova remnants now. I see it's nice to look at supernova, they have very pretty remnants um, and yeah they're very interesting that's why I thought it was good to show show a lot of nice pictures in this in this lecture. Um, so this is Tycho supernova remnant. So at its peak brightness it was actually as bright as Venus and it was visible in the day. Um, it, it was observed first in 1572 and it remained visible with, with the eyes um, until 1574. Um, this was the last one to go off in our own galaxy. So almost 450 years later, um, astronomers have actually used X-ray observations of Tycho to build the first ever 3D map of a type 1A supernova remnant. So this was a type 1A supernova. So this image here um, is a wide field view of the region around Tycho supernova. And it shows this expanding bubble of the supernova explosion. So the colours in this image show different X-ray energies. So it's all in X-ray. Um, red is low X-ray energy, green is medium X-ray energy, and blue is high X-ray energy. So after around 450 years of expansion, so it's been expanding outwards for 450 years, it appears as it's a roughly spherical cloud with, with lots of, of clumpy bits, clumpy bits of gas in it, as you can see. Um, but interestingly, the forward shockwave of the supernova is tw has twice the velocity on one side of the shell than the other. So we have a shell of gas that's expanding outwards and the velocity of gas on one side is different from the velocity of the gas on the other side. So to try and understand, you know, this difference in the velocity, um, people have uh, gone and ran 3D hydrodynamical simulations of this supernova remnant. So a hydrodynamical simulation is a, a simulation where we model um, the gas and how the gas moves, um, how it evolves. And this was carried out by um, William and other Williams and other authors in 2017, and is shown in this image here. And they stopped it at the current day, what we observe now. Um, so as, as you can see, we have this starts from a nice, uniform, smooth explosion, and this starts from a more it has clumpy gas in it, so it looks a bit different. So they selected a lot of these um, knots of gas um, in, the, in this ejected gas we see here and measured the motion of these knots of gas and their velocity. And these measurements were combined to actually build this map, this full 3D map of the, the ejected gas. So they found they have total velocities that, that can range from 2,400 to 6,600 kilometers per second. So there's quite a lot of difference in the velocities in here. Um, but the ejector, the ejector doesn't display much asymmetry in the motion. So it suggests that when the supernovae first went off, it was quite symmetric then. We had a nice sphere, of an expanding sphere, and it was very symmetric. Um, so yeah, these show both a smooth um, distribution of gas and a clumpy distribution of gas. Um, and these models are quite consistent with the current observations that we have of the uh, supernova remnant of Tycho. So we can use these observations to make models to try and understand what's happening there and why we see what we see. We have another two supernova remnants here. So the image on the left um, is, is called SNR 0509 for short. So it has a longer name than that. So this bubble is the visible remnant of a supernova explosion in the large malogenic cloud 
this is a small galaxy that's quite close to us in the Milky Way, but it is a different galaxy. Um, so this shell here has a diameter of about seven parsec and it's expanding at 5,000 kilometers per second. This is most likely a type 1a supernova based on the elements that we detected in, in this ejector in 2004. Now, this explosion would have occurred 400 years ago, but there aren't actually any recordings of a new star in the direction of the large myogenic cloud 400 years ago. So we don't know whether anyone did notice it then, but we can see the remnant now. Um, so this is a, a composite image, so it means it has um, there's different observations that have been put together. So we can see this nice image we have now. Um, so we have um, X-ray data taken from the Chandra, the X-ray observatory. Um, so the soft green and blue colours here are heated material. So this is hot gas and it glows at X-ray wavelengths. This material is surrounded by a pink, a pink shell here, um, which shows the present location of the shock wave. So this expanding wave that's come from the explosion of the supernova um, is traveling out into the surrounding gas, into the interstellar medium, and it's collecting this gas up as it goes along, collecting it up into a shell, and it's causing it to glow. Um, this supernova remnant here is a supernova 1006. This again is a composite, so we have different wavelengths put together to give us this lovely picture that we see here. So we have visible um, or optical uh, observations here. We have radio observations, which are in red, and we have X-ray observations, which are in blue. And we can see uh, the full shell of the supernova remnant using these three different wavelengths. Um, but you can see the, the radio data in red and the X-ray in blue are more or less in the same place. The visible light, though, only comes from around here, which is observed with Hubble. The entire object has a radius of about 20 parsecs. Um, we can only tell that based on its distance. This is a very pretty pictures in different wavelengths of supernova remnants. We have another supernova remnant here, Cassiopeia A, also known as Cass A. This is the youngest known remnant from a supernova explosion in the Milky Way. Um, it's 3.4 kiloparsec away from us. Um, and this is expanding, um, the expanding cloud of material left over from a supernova explosion. It's about three parsecs in diameter and the show is expanding at 4,000 to 6,000 kilometers per second with a very high temperature of 10 to the seven Kelvin. So light from the supernova explosion would have first reached Earth about 300 years ago. But again, there's no recording of seeing a supernova like that 300 years ago there. Um, the various colors here, well, in, in this one on the left, um, show differences in chemical composition. So the bright green you can see here, um, where it's rich in oxygen, and red and purple are rich in sulfur. Blue is composed, I can't see much blue on here, blue is mostly hydrogen and nitrogen. This right image is the same supernova remnant, but it has data in three different wavelengths. There's red, there's a red which is infrared data from the Spitzer Space Telescope, Gold, which is visible data from the Hubble Space Telescope, and blue and green are X-ray data from the Chandray X-ray Observatory. And you can see here how this small blue dot in the middle is a remnant of the star's core. So this is the same supernova remnant, but looking at it in different wavelengths. And you can see, we can see a lot more structure um, because the gas is emitting at different wavelengths. So I wanted to show you this supernova remnant as well. And it's quite different to the others because it's not a nice spherical shape like the others. So this is in a star forming region in the large monogenic cloud. 
which is an outside galaxy very close to the Milky Way. It's thought the progenitor of this could have been a star about 50 times the mass of the sun. Um, and so the density around the star, the interstellar medium, could have been very low because when you have these massive stars, they have big stellar winds and the winds go out into the ISM and they can push gas away. So that when the supernova explodes, there isn't much gas left there for the shell to expand into. So this region here has quite dense clumps of gas that could have gone on to form stars. But because of this supernova explosion, they're being disrupted. Um, they're being pushed around, mixed. So they won't go on to form stars anymore because of this powerful supernova explosion that's disrupting them. And the last supernova remnant I'm going to show you is the Crab Nebula. This is the result of a supernova that was noted by observers in 1054. Um, it's in the Perseus arm of the Milky Way galaxy. It's quite close to us, about two kiloparsecs from us, or 6,500 light years. It has a, a diameter of 3.4 uh, parsecs, um, and it's expanding about 1,500 kilometers per second. So this is, I think is very nice. It shows supernova remnant in all these different wavelengths. So it's bright in all of them. It's bright in radio, and these are observations from the Very Large Array. It's bright in infrared, observations from the Spitzer Space Telescope. It's bright in the optical, observations from the Hubble Space Telescope. Bright in the ultraviolet, observations from XMM Newton Space Telescope. And bright in the X-ray, observations from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And you can see the gas is bright in all these different wavelengths. So there's lots going on there to this gas for it to be radiating in these different wavelengths. Um, and we can use these observations in different wavelengths to investigate the supernova remnant. We can look at um, its composition, its velocity. We can you know, infer its properties from looking at these observations in different wavelengths. For example, we know that if it's radiating in X-rays, there must be hot gas there because hot gas ra radiates in X-rays. In the very center of this nebula is a pulsar. This is a neutron star, which is about as massive as the sun, but it's only the size of a small town. And this pulsar rotates around 30 times every second. So I said if we look at these images of supernova remnants, we can try and learn a bit more about the process behind it, what's happened. So most of the energy, about 99% of the energy that's released in a supernova explosion is in the form of energetic neutrinos. Neutrinos are very light particles with very little mass, which don't usually react um, with matter. In this case, they will because there's so many of them and they're very energetic um, and they travel into the, light, the outer layers of the star. The energy that's important here is the kinetic energy, which is what the rest of the energy is converted into. So the stellar material, so remember the, the onion like layers of the picture I showed you for the core collapse supernovae. Um, the kinetic energy is going to move out and accelerate this material in the outer layers of the, of the star to speeds greater than the speed of sound. This then causes a shock wave and this moves outward from the central star. So this high velocity material that's moving outwards, it plows outwards into that material and into the interstellar medium where there is gas there. And it sweeps up this gas a bit like a snowplow. Um, and the interstellar medium then becomes enriched with this stellar material that's been blown off in this explosion. So all those elements that were in these layers of the star have now been pushed out was in this explosion into the interstellar medium. Um, and this is what we see when we look at the supernova remnants. We see this material that's been collected up, swept up and pushed outwards. So the dynamical evolution, so how the supernova remnant um, moves, can be described by a model. And this then allows us to predict the behavior of supernova remnants. And we can estimate the properties of the star 
um, you know, that the supernova came from. Um, this means we can estimate the age of remnant from its radius and how fast the gas in this shell is traveling. We have this compact object at the center. The gas has been pushed out at very high velocity. It's very energetic. This red here is a, th is a thin shell of all the material it's swept up as it's gone outwards. And this shows an artist's impression of the evolution of the supernova remnant Cas A. So these aren't real images, just this last one, which is the observation. Um, this is what we currently see from the supernova remnant. So you can see it starts off where there's nothing there. It's just a normal star. And then suddenly it becomes extremely bright. So it increased in brightness by about 10 orders of magnitude. As time goes on, the shell of gas that's being swept outwards is expanding and it sweeps up the interstellar medium so the gas that it comes across as it's moving outward, it sweeps it up as it goes along and it gets larger and larger. But as it gets larger, it does start to cool and then it starts to lose the spherical shape. So we're not, uh, this isn't quite a sphere anymore of gas like it was there. But this is just an artist's impression, so this isn't real. However, we have seen the evolution of a real supernova remnant in real time. So this image is um, the evolution of SN 1993. This was observed over a period of seven years from May 1993 to February 2000. So you can see this is the earliest observation. It goes along like this till we get to the latest observation here. So this is really, really cool because we can see a change over seven years. So we can observe this supernova remnant changing in our lifetimes. So stars usually seem to be unchanging. So stars sit on the main sequence for a long time, millions, billions of years. And even in the red giant branch, they spend a long time there. So we don't see them changing in our lifetime we only see one stage and we don't see that change. But with a supernova remnant, we can see over seven years that it's expanded and it expanded outwards. And we can, we can see that happening in our lifetime. So we have, we have these observations of this supernova remnant um, evolving. So can, can we model this so we can understand the supernova better and what is happening? Well, the evolution of a supernova remnant can be divided into uh, three different phases um, and it depends on uh, what physical processes are happening at the time and what's important. Simplified models can be made for at least the first stages um, of the supernova remnant. And this can give us an idea of time scales, the velocity of the expansion and the size of the remnant. And then we can make predictions based on the observations that we can see today. So the three phases here, there's a free expansion phase. This happens immediately after the core has collapsed and it can last from 100 to 1,000 years. The set of Taylor phases next, and this can last between 10,000 to 20,000 years. And the cooling phase is the last phase. And this just lasts until the shell of gas that's expanded cools enough to mix with the ISM. And then it's just mixed in and we, we don't see the supernova remnant anymore. So in the free expansion phase, um, we can tell things about the velocity and radius of the supernova remnant. So when the core collapses and the material that was on top of the core collapses and rebounds, this creates a shock wave. The shock wave moves outwards um, through the stellar material and into the interstellar medium, which we can presume is, is a constant density near the star. And it goes out into this material at a very high supersonic speed. So during this first phase, the, the gas that's around the star, it doesn't have an influence on the expansion um, of this shockwave and this shell of gas. 
So if we assume that um, most of the supernova energy um, is excluding the part that's carried away by neutrinos, so we say 10 to the 51 ergs of energy goes into kinetic energy, we can estimate the ejection velocity uh, using this equation. So this is kinetic energy. Energy is half mv squared, where this is the mass of the ejected material. So this is the mass, the layers that were on top of the iron core. This is the mass of those layers. Um, and v is the ejection velocity. So the velocity they've you know, started moving outwards at. We can rearrange it to get an equation for the ejection velocity here. And we can estimate this supernova energy and estimate the mass of material ejected. Now, as this ejector expands out from the star, um, it's passing through the interstellar medium, so the gas that's outside of the star. And it can heat this up to 10 to 7 to 10 to 8 Kelvin, so it's very hot. Um, and this is hot enough to separate electrons from their atoms, so we get ions. Um, and this then generates thermal X-rays. So this interstellar medium is accelerated by the shockwave and is taken away from the site of the supernovae um, at a velocity that's a bit less than the initial velocity of the shockwave. This then results in a thin expanding shell. So we have a thin shell of gas, which is expanding outwards. While this material that's swept up by this shell is a lot less than the mass of the stellar ejector, so when it goes outwards, it collects the mass from all the layers in the star and then goes out into the interstellar medium. When this interstellar medium mass is less than the mass that it swept up from the layers of the star, um, the expansion proceeds with more or less a constant velocity, which is equal to the initial shockwave speed. And this is typically on the order of 10,000 kilometers per second. This is known as the free expansion phase, so it expands freely into the interstellar medium and it might last for about 200 years, a few hundred years. Um, and at that point, the shockwave swept up as much material as the initial stellar ejector. Um, so we can estimate the value of the shell using this equation if we assume the velocity in that time is constant. So at this time, a supernova might be about three parsecs in size. And although the, the supernova remnant is radiating thermal X-ray radiation, um, the initial energy of the shockwave hasn't changed very much. So this ESN is roughly the same. So as the shell moves outwards, the mass of gas that it's sweeping up on the outside gets larger and larger as it's expanding. Now, as there's more mass there, this starts to affect the expansion and it starts to slow down because there's more mass to push. So it's, it's harder to push more mass. So this is the end of the free expansion phase. And at the end of the free expansion phase, we can estimate the radius of the super, supernova remnant um, using this equation. And SW here is stand, it stands for swept up. So the swept up radius, it sweeps the gas up as it moves outwards. Um, and this is assuming that, um, assuming a constant density. So in reality, it's nearly constant, maybe outside of the star. Well, we can rearrange this to get the swept up mass if we know the ejector mass and the density of the interstellar medium. And then this can give us an age of the supernova remnant. So we know how long ago the supernova explosion occurred. Um, yeah, so we can get information about the age of the supernova explosion and the rate of the supernova explosion from this free expansion phase. So around this time, the structure of the supernova remnant then changes because it's swept up so much mass, it's heavy, then a reverse shock starts to travel inwards and it heats the gas there to high temperatures. And after some time, we have some pressure um, gradient and then the supernova remnant enters the next phase, 
where the expansion is driven by the pressure of this hot gas inside. So that gas inside is very hot, a thin shell of material is expanding outwards. The hot gas pushes this shell outwards further. And this is the set of Taylor phase. So this phase begins when the mass of the, the interstellar medium that's been swept up is roughly equal to the ejected stellar mass. So the mass in the layers, when you eventually have a mass of gas that was outside of the star equal to that, then we're in the next phase. So the wave, the, the shell is now going to begin to slow down. Um, the internal energy of the, the shock is still very, very large compared to how much energy you lose through radiation. Um, so the total energy remains nearly constant. So we can assume that the total energy is remaining constant there. The rate of the expansion of this shell um, is determined by the initial energy of the shock wave and the density of the interstellar medium. So that's all we need to know um, to estimate the radius and to estimate the velocity. So this phase can last 10,000 years, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. And the radius of the shell would be about 30 parsecs. So these equations des describe this set of Taylor phase. So it can be also called a blast wave phase. For a blast wave, if we have the initial explosion energy here, and we have the density of the gas that it's expanding into. Um, if we know the time, we can estimate the radius. And we can also estimate the velocity if we know these three properties. So this is the age T, the density of the interstellar medium here, which is rho, the Greek letter. And we have the energy of the initial supernova explosion here. So we have two equations here, which mean that if we know the age of the supernova, we can estimate the radius of the shell of the, that's moving outwards and the velocity that it's moving with. And this is what you're going to look at in one of the Python exercises. You look at how the radius of the shell um, evolves with time and the velocity, and then compare that to a real supernova remnant. Now, as this supernova remnant is expanding, um, it's cooling adiabatically, and it will reach a critical temperature of about 10 to the 6 Kelvin. Now, at this temperature, the ionized atoms, so you have ions, you have electrons that, are, um, electrons that have left their atoms, so you have ionized, we have ions there. Um, and at this temperature, 10 to the 6 Kelvin, ions can start to get their electrons back and then they lose their energy by radiation. So now at this stage, the energy that's lost by radiation becomes important and this stops the shell from expanding adiabatically. So before it was the thermal pressure that was pushing the shell outwards, but if the ions gain electrons and they can cool, then you no longer have that thermal pressure. So the expansion of the shell then slows down. Now you get a dense cool shell. So you have this cool gas that's forming directly behind the shock front. So this now, the supernova remnant enters this cooling phase or we call it a snow plow phase um, because more and more of this interstellar medium is collected and swept up until the gas that's been swept up is much, much larger than the ejected mass um, from the star originally. So you have the free expansion phase, which is mainly the ejected gas, the gas that's in those layers of the star being pushed outwards. And then when that mass becomes almost the same as the mass of the interstellar medium that's been swept up in the set of Taylor phase, when that as that mass gets larger and larger, as it goes outwards and outwards, we get mass that's much, much larger than the mass that was ejected. So finally, the shell will break up, start to break up into um, individual clumps. Um, so we, we don't have that nice spherical shell anymore. The shell starts to break up. And this is due to Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities. And we get these instabilities when we have um, 
a hot, thin shell of gas that pushes a cool, dense gas. And so eventually the supernova remnant mixes into the interstellar medium and the velocity of the gas drops to values typical of the interstellar medium. So you have random motions at about 10 kilometers per second. So then the supernova remnant is lost in the interstellar medium and it's no longer visible. So it's so large, it's cooled down, it's slowed down, and it's mixed into the interstellar medium. So we no longer see that nice supernova remnant anymore. And this can take about a billion years to happen, to get to the stage where we can no longer see it. Now, can we look, take these phases and compare them to real supernova remnants? Uh, well, yes, we can. So we have an example here of a supernova remnant that's in the free expansion phase or the end of the free expansion phase, uh, Cas A. So this is about 300 years old um, and it's moving at a velocity of about 6,000 kilometers per second with a size of about three parsec. So at visible wavelengths, there are many um, knots of emission that are moving razily outwards from the center. Um, and these knots of emission are rich in oxygen. And so they're clumps of matter that have been ejected from near the center of the star. Remember the onion layers. So these clumps of oxygen have been ejected from near the center of the star and they've been pushed out this far away from the star, three parsec. We have an example of a supernova remnant in the set of Taylor phase here, the Crab Nebula. So it's aged about a thousand years old, it's traveling with a velocity of 1,500 kilometers per second and has a radius of 3.4 parsecs. That's not that different to um, this one, but it's in a different, a different phase. So a lot of this, so it's in a different phase. So a lot of this depends on, um, it depends on the energy of the initial explosion. It depends on the density of the gas that the shell is expanding out into. An example of a supernova remnant in the, the cooling phase or the snow play phase is the Cygnus loop. Now this is thought to be 20 to 40,000 years old and its expansion velocity is slowed down to 120 kilometers per second. This is so big that parts of it are actually recognized as individual nebulas. So it's, it's very, very large and actually bits of it like this are thought to be its own, a separate nebula. So this is the whole supernova in this image. This is the entire supernova remnant. Um, and this image here comes from this green square here, is this image here. So you can see that in more detail. And you can see here that filaments are forming. So this is quite dense here and it's thermally unstable to the formation of filaments. And this is seen um, in the optical. And you can see that this isn't um, spherical anymore. It's broken up, parts of it are mixed with the ISM. So this here has gone. So it's cooled and mixed in with the ISM. So we just don't see it anymore. Um, but there are still parts here that haven't mixed yet. This is what a very old supernova remnant would look like, or does look like. Um, and this is thought to have, um, to have come from a star that was about 20 solar masses. So it's a, a very massive star. Now, the, the stages of the supernova remnant evolution can be fairly well described by our simple theory. Um, there are, um, you know, many, many things that should be mentioned that don't agree with this simple expansion of a spherical shell. So in this simple model, the explosion energy of the supernova is um, deposited evenly in all directions. So you have a supernova explosion, the energy comes out spherically, and then the ISM around it is swept up in a uniform spherical shell. But in reality, this is much more complicated. So firstly, um, 
the progenitors of supernova remnants they're massive stars they're massive stars usually have um you know very strong stellar winds and so the the interstellar medium that's around the star these strong stellar winds can push this interstellar medium away so this is in you know earlier phases main sequence red giant phases and the strong stellar winds can push the interstellar medium away now, if it's pushed away, then when the supernova explosion happens and the supernova explosion um, starts to travel out into the interstellar medium, that's already quite low density because the gas has been moved before. So our simple model does not take this into account. Um, and when the shell then expands into this low density ISM, it's not going to sweep up very much mass because the mass has already been moved by these strong stellar winds. And therefore it might stay in the free expansion phase for longer because it doesn't sweep up very much mass. Whereas a star that has lots of material around it will be in the free expansion phase for a shorter amount of time. Another complication with this model is that the, the interstellar medium it expands into isn't uniform. So it's not all the same density around the star there might be a bit here that's higher density and a bit here that's lower density and so this difference could um confuse the whether you're in the blast wave phase or the snowplow phase so a portion of gas that passes through a dense cloud might be in the snowplow phase because it's it's swept up a lot of gas there and it might switch to the snowplow phase but the a portion of the um the shell that expands into a low density region might then still be in the set of Taylor phase because it hasn't swept up as much gas. So where you have your star and your um, area that it expands into, it's not the same all the way around. So you get asymmetrical expansion of the shell. Um, and the shell on this side might be in a different phase to the shell that's on that side. Um, Another thing to remember is that massive stars are usually born in stellar associations. So stars are usually born in clusters. So they're not on their own. They're usually in a cluster of stars. And so they will go supernovae. So massive stars burn through their fuel quickly. It doesn't take very long to get to the supernova phase. They will go supernovae while they're still close to each other. So remnants of supernovae that are next to each other could actually merge to form a single super bubble. So you have a supernova remnant here, a supernova remnant here. And as they expand, they could form one large bubble. Um, so, and, and, and these bubbles, um, the super bubbles are a source of heating for the interstellar medium. So in reality, it's much more complicated we, we have a very simple model um, and we can estimate things like the radius and the velocity from there. And we get numbers that are close, but some supernovae are very different. It depends, um, it depends on, on different things. But we can get a good estimate from our simple model. So it's good that a very simple model that we can put into a Python script does describe supernova um, to some extent. So supernova remnants are very important for our understanding of, of our galaxy. They're the source of a lot of the energy that heats up the interstellar medium. So the supernova remnants sweep up the interstellar medium and push it to very, very large distances. So we're mixing those elements around the galaxy. Whereas if you had a small star that ended its life as a white dwarf, some material, um, does expand into the interstellar medium, but it stays close to the star. And with a supernova remnant, it pushes out to very large distances far away from the star. So it can mix with gas um, further away. Um, so it also heats the interstellar medium gas, which prevents it from collapsing to form more stars. So stars form from cold, dense clouds. So the clouds of gas need to collapse under gravity um, to become high density to form a star. If a supernova remnant comes along and it heats up this gas, it can't collapse to form more stars. Um, 
And yeah, elements that are heavier than iron are created in the powerful blast of a supernova explosion, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And these are mixed into the interstellar medium, mixed around to sites where eventually more stars will form in the future. So most of the elements, except for hydrogen, in your body are stellar material that has been redistributed by a supernova remnant. So it's made in stars, had a supernova explosion, they spread it around the galaxy. So understanding how supernova remnants evolve um, can help us to understand many important processes in the galaxy. Um, so one of the important things is um, galactic fountains. So supernova explosions that heat the interstellar medium can drive hot gas out of the galaxy disk. So this is um, this isn't an observation. This is an, an artist's impression of our galaxy disk here. The sun is here, and this is the center of the galaxy. So supernova explosions in the interstellar medium can drive hot gas out of the disk in what we call galactic fountains. And this forms a halo of hot gas around the Milky Way. So we have our disk and then we have a spherical halo of hot gas around it. This halo was detected by the Rosa X-ray telescope in the early 1990s. And we've seen similar halos around other galaxies as well. So in this galactic fountain um, scenario, the gas is pushed out and it can rise above the disk, as we can see see here rising above the disk it can reach heights of a few kiloparsec and this then emits radiation and it be can become cooler the cool gas then starts to condense into clouds which can fall back onto the disk so this is why we call it a fountain because it's going upwards cooling coming back down um, so it's a bit like a fountain um, and this creates a, a global circulation of galactic gas. So it spreads all this gas around the galaxy. It comes in and out and it, it's just spread around large distances. Um, and it connects the galaxy disk with the halo. Um, so radio observations of hydrogen gas in our galaxy has shown structures that are thought to be super bubbles from supernova remnants that are coming out of the disk. Um, but we can't see the hot gas actually rising into the halo because the x-rays from the hot gas are absorbed by material in the disk. So before it gets to us, it's absorbed by other material in the disk. So, so supernova remnants are responsible for gas in the galactic halo. So the galaxy isn't just, just the disk and there's nothing else there. We have a disk and then we have a halo of gas around the disk. And we wouldn't have that without supernova remnants. So this shows that um, you know, supernova remnants, galactic fountains are very important for mixing gas in the interstellar medium. You know, it doesn't, we can spread material out this way and spread metals out this way. Um, and that's how we get, you know, our sun is a small star, um, but how we've got the material to form the planets, um, not just earth and the material on earth, but the other planets, We've got them through massive stars, um, fusing them in their cores, exploding as a supernova, and the supernova remnant spreading it around the galaxy. So I'm just going to talk briefly about nucleosynthesis of the heavy elements. So earlier on, I mentioned that stars up to 10 solar masses fuse nuclei in their core until they get up to iron then when an iron core is formed, fusion can't go any further um, because it requires energy to fuse rather than giving out energy. So there are lots of elements heavier than iron. So where do these come from? Well, a lot of them are produced in supernova explosions. So without supernova explosions, you wouldn't have a lot of these elements. So just before the core collapse, the interior of a massive star looks like an onion. So I showed you this picture earlier. We have shells of lighter and lighter elements when we move away from the core. So we have an iron core, a layer of silicon, a layer of oxygen, and all these have been formed from nuclear fusion, a layer of neon, carbon, helium, and the hydrogen is still on the outside. 
So most of the heavy elements are formed in supernova explosions. When the core collapses and the material falls towards the core, um, it rebounds in a shock wave, and this shock wave explodes out through these onion like layers. It heats the gas that's in these layers to very, very high temperatures and it compresses them to high densities. And nuclear reactions are very temperature sensitive, so we need high temperatures, we need high densities for these reactions to take place. But nuclear synthesis that might have taken days or years in the star can now occur in seconds because we have that temperature and we have that density to make these reactions occur in seconds. So nuclei quickly fuse with elements like oxygen and silicon and we can build up elements as heavy as nickel. And this process is called explosive silicon and oxygen burning. Elements formed in this way include elements like sulfur and argon and also the radioactive elements like nickel and cobalt. These are a major source of energy for the early months of the supernova light curve. So when the supernova is at its brightest very early on, um, these are a major source of energy for that. Um, and eventually, after a few hours, the shockwave reaches the surface of the star. So we have the iron core, the materials falling inwards, shockwave bounces outwards. And eventually, you get back to the surface, that top hydrogen layer. And then um, it expels all this stellar material, um, all the elements that have been created in fusion when the star was on the main sequence in the red giant branch and the elements that have just been created by the supernova explosion expels all that material into the interstellar medium. So supernova from massive stars produce most of the elements from oxygen to calcium and about half of the iron, cobalt and nickel. So elements heavier than iron are produced almost exclusively in type two supernovae. So they can be produced other ways, but mostly produced this way. So the shock wave as it travels out generates a large number of neutrons. It hits atoms in its path and there's a lot of neutrons around. So the nuclei that are in these shells are bombarded by neutrons. There's all these neutrons traveling outwards um, and they can capture these neutrons and grow larger and larger. Um, in, into different elements. So this, this is called the R process, which is rapid neutron capture. Um, and we can form a lot of elements this way. Um, unfortunately, we won't learn much more about this from this lecture, but if we had the whole day of Thai pass, like was originally planned, you would have learned more about that as well. But I don't have time to talk about that in this lecture. Um, but this hopefully makes it a bit clearer. So this is a periodic table and the colours show you where these elements have come from. So we have Big Bang fusion here in blue. We have hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium. So these, these are present at the start of the universe just after the Big Bang. And then the dying low mass stars produce a lot of these green, green elements here. What we're talking about is supernova, the exploding massive stars here, um, the type two core collapse supernovae, and we also have the type 1a supernova here, the exploding white dwarfs. Well, you can see the exploding massive stars are responsible for producing all these elements here. So in the layers of that star, um, of the elements that have been created through fusion in the star's core, you only have a few elements there. You don't have all of the elements that are here on the periodic table. So most of these elements are produced in a core collapse supernovae explosion. You have some elements higher than iron here as well. So most of the elements really um, in the common earth are produced in supernova explosion. The rest, the heaviest you get from merging neutron stars, which are even um, more extreme densities and temperatures. And I'm not going to talk about that here, but it's a nice um, image to show you where the elements come from. And this is just an example um, of supernovae ejector. So you're going to be looking at data like this in one of your um, Python exercises. So this is the mass fraction here on this axis, the fraction of mass that is a certain element. 
And this is a mass coordinate here on this axis. And this is basically how far away you are from the star. You have the central remnant here, the core that's left over after the supernova explosion. And you can see how much of each element you have. So you have oxygen there, magnesium there, silicon, calcium, and you can see how much, um, yeah, how much of each element is there as you go further away from the star. So this, this is from a model of a core collapse supernovae, um, of a star that had 20, um, a mass of 20 solar masses. And so here's your central remnant. And then as you go outwards, this is the amount of each of these elements that you might expect to find there. And so yeah, you're gonna do something similar to this in your Python exercise. So, um, as a summary, um, we've talked a lot about supernova. So you know, the, we know supernova explosions are very, very energetic events, and they're powerful enough to influence the evolution of the whole galaxy because they push the gas so far, the supernova remnants become so large, um, they can influence the evolution of the whole galaxy. They enrich the interstellar medium with metals that are formed in nuclear synthesis. So both the metals that are found in the... Um, both metals that are fused in the star itself along its main lifetime and the ones that are formed from the supernova explosion as well. They transport them far away in this explosion and they mix with the ISM. And then we can form things like you know, the planets that we see today. But also they heat up the interstellar medium, which is important to regulate the amount of star formation. So if the supernova remnants weren't there going through the interstellar medium and heating up the gas, we would have a lot more star formation. So yeah, the very energetic events. Um, we get new elements that we wouldn't have otherwise if it was just, uh, if we just had a lot of low mass stars um, and they heat up the interstellar medium. Um, so that's it from me. So thank you very, very much for listening. I hope you found it interesting. Your Python activities are going to be based around what I've talked about in this lecture. Um, uh, please do ask us any questions. Um, you know, it's very, it's very different to being there in person and, you know, being able to talk to you and see your code and help you go through those steps. So I appreciate it's going to be more difficult for you doing this at home um on your own but please do ask us questions we would love to hear your questions you can ask questions about the lecture or questions about the um python activities we don't mind you asking us anything um i'm going to stop sharing my screen so yeah thank you very very much for listening any questions please do get in touch with us and good luck with doing the python activities i hope you all enjoy them Thank you again. Bye.